Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I'm Miss Angler, and in today's lesson, we are going to be looking at the scientific method. Now, if you're new here, don't forget to like and subscribe and turn your notifications on if you want to stay on track with your science learning this year. I'd like to let you know also that I'll be posting every Tuesday and Thursday. Thursday is going to be more of science content. It's going to be very specific stuff, whereas Tuesday posts are going to be centered around things like study study tips, how to study, how to apply for university, more of the social side of my page. Now in this video, we are going to go over the basics of the scientific method. And before you hear, we have a very simple diagram of how we step through it. Now, our scientific method is based off of observation. We see something in nature and we want to figure out how it works. So we ask ourselves a question. Why is this happening? When does it happen? And now in order for us to test that question, we have to come up with a hypothesis. We have to think maybe what is going to happen. We create an experiment, we analyze the results that come from that experiment and we write a conclusion. Now the scientific method is really important for all of your um, studying in science, particularly in the high school level and then on into tertiary education. And I'm gonna break it down to you in the easiest way so that you can always remember it in class, but also most importantly in those exams. So let's get into it. So let's look at the first component of our scientific method, the aim. Now throughout this video, I'm going to use this example that we have on the page now, and I'll read through it shortly. And I'm using it because it's gonna make it nice and easy for us to apply what we're learning in an example that you may see in an activity in class or in an exam. So let's break down what an aim is and how we write one. So first things first, what is an aim? The aim is the purpose or the reason for why we are conducting the experiment. We asked a question, now we need to give purpose to what we are looking for. Now, when we're writing an aim, we need to make sure that our aim is concise, which means it must be short and sweet. And most importantly, it must be without a predicted result. In other words, you're not saying what's going to happen. You're simply talking about the purpose of the experiment. And we'll look at the example on the right hand side soon. Another thing that's very important for an aim so that you get all your marks is that it should contain an independent and a dependent variable. Now, if you're not sure what these are just yet, it is in the next portion of the video and I'm going to outline what they are. Most importantly as well, your aim must be a statement, not a question. It is not a question. Remember, we created our scientific question at the beginning of this. We are now creating an experiment to answer that question. So our aim mustn't start with words like what and where and when. Instead, we should start our um, aim with to test, to determine, to measure. And there are many other words that you can use to show that it is an aim. Now, let's look alongside on the right here at the example I've provided us. And we can actually take the aim out of this paragraph. And it's really easy to see once you know what you have to look for. And many times you have to do this in tests and exams. So it says an experiment was performed in a laboratory to investigate the effect of the concentration of sucrose, which is a sugar, on the rate of cellular respiration in the yeast cells. Now, before I even read any further, I can see the aim is already provided to us because I've looked out for the key words that we start aim with. And that is things like to investigate. To investigate is one of our key aim starters. And what that means is, is that the rest of this statement is our aim. So what is the aim for this investigation? It is the effect of concentration of sucrose on the rate of cellular respiration in yeast cells. So that entire blue underlined section is our aim. And I'm going to show you in the next slide that we can select the independent and the dependent variables from this statement already. And it's so nice because it's already provided to us. We don't have to come up with one on our own. Now that we've looked at the aim, we need to focus in on the independent and dependent variables. And a lot of people struggle to identify these particular variables. So let's look at what they are first, and then let's find them in the paragraph that we've been given. 
So what are the variables when we speak about them? Essentially, they are the cause and the effect. And the independent variable is our cause and our dependent variable is the effect. Now, when we speak about the independent variable, we are speaking about the variable, the thing that you have chosen to test or measure, and it's going to affect the outcome of the experiment. The dependent variable, on the other hand, is what we are measuring, and it has an unknown outcome. In other words, we don't know what's going to happen just yet. We need to see. So the dependent variable is unpredictable. A nice way that I like to use for my own students so that they can remember how one affects the other is that the dependent variable depends, that's where it gets its name from, it depends on the independent variable. In other words, whatever we are choosing to test, the independent variable, will produce some kind of outcome. And that outcome we can't predict, and it's dependent on the independent variable. Now, we're looking at our paragraph in front of us, and we need to select the independent and dependent variables. Now, I want to remind you the aim which started at to investigate the effect of the concentration of sucrose and the rate of cellular respiration in yeast cells. So now that is the aim. This aim is very well written, and that is because it starts correctly, and secondly, it contains the variables we need. So let me highlight the two variables, and I'll show you how I did that. So it says to investigate, and then it says the effect of concentration of sucrose on the rate of cellular respiration. This part here, where it says the effect of the concentration of sucrose is going to be our independent variable. Why and how do I know that it's the independent variable? Because it's the thing that we are testing, right? It says to investigate, to test. We are testing the concentration of sucrose of a sugar. That's the independent variable. On the other hand, we also need the dependent variable, the thing that we are measuring. And that goes on to the next part of the sentence where it says the rate of cellular respiration in yeast cells. That is our dependent variable. Now, how do I know that? Well, the rate of cellular respiration depends on how much sugar you give those yeast cells. Do you see what I did there? That's why I starred that little sentence at the bottom of the, of the slide. It's because one thing, the cellular respiration, depends on the other, the independent variable. And now we have isolated our two variables. It's really important that when you are identifying them in your own exam or test or activity in school, that you're able to identify the independent and dependent. A nice little easy way also to keep in the back of your mind is the independent variable is the thing you are controlling. The dependent thing is the thing that you are measuring. And generally we measure things in height, speed, rate, distance. And so you need to look for things like hours, minutes, liters, um, kilometers per hour. Those are the clues to give you between the dependent and the independent variables. Now we get to the more tricky stuff. And it's at this point that I want to highlight to you that if you switch on notifications for my YouTube channel, you will get consistent updates on when I'm posting more videos and you'll be able to practice your scientific method writing by watching some of my other videos where I include examples from tests and exams. And you can even watch as I walk you through past paper questions. Now, hypotheses sometimes are quite difficult to write because we have incorrectly identified the variables. But if you do that simple step, as we did just before, it'll be really straightforward. So let's start off with what exactly is the hypothesis. A hypothesis is what the investigator hopes will occur, and it's based off of often previous research. In other words, it's not a random guess. There is some education to it. There is some knowledge about what you think will happen. It's important to know that at a high school level, a hypothesis is not always necessarily going to be true and provable. In other words, you often do a lot of hypothetical testing. You don't do physical testing in the classroom. 
I also want to point out that if you are in a higher level, so you're in tertiary education, in college, in university, and you're using this as an easy introduction to how to write a hypothesis, I want to point out that often at that level in tertiary education, your hypothesis will be written in the negative. In other words, you will always write it like you're disproving what you've said because it's always easier to disprove something. In high school, we're still starting off with the basics. And and so this is how we're going to write a hypothesis and keep it nice and easy and simple. These rules also apply to what you would do in university as well. So the first thing is you may not use any I, we, me, they, us. And that is because we need to use formal language. Science does not include any kinds of these first person words. And so you exclude them and you simply write a simple statement, which brings me to the next point. A hypothesis must always include include the independent and dependent variables. Now, if you've already identified the aim and in doing so identified the variables, then this next step is really easy because you have everything you need. I'm going to show you how to put it all together. Now, when you write your hypothesis, it needs to be in the future tense. And I use an example like will have an effect. In other words, you're speaking about what will happen because you haven't obviously conducted the experiment just yet. So taking our example on the screen now, specifically focusing in on the effect of our concentration of sucrose on the rate of cellular respiration in yeast cells, we need to write a hypothesis. And this is what I would say as a hypothesis. It is said that as the concentration of sucrose increases, the rate of cellular respiration in yeast cells will also increase. Now, that's just my hypothesis. Yours could be as the concentration of sucrose increases, the rate of respiration decreases. At this point, it's okay to use either one because we don't know the outcome. Remember, a hypothesis is what we think will happen. We're not so certain. If, however, you have been provided results in a table, you should try and mold your answer around what you can see in the table of results. But we'll get to that very soon. Next is method and materials. Now, depending on what kind of activity you're doing, you will either be given the method and materials, like the example we're working with, as you can see, it's in the bullets, or you're going to have to come up with your own. And I'm going to teach you how to work with both pieces of information. So first of all, what exactly is the method and the materials? So these are all of our steps that we need to carry out our experiment. And very importantly, it's the exact measurements, very exact. It's basically like our ingredient list and our recipe. And you have to be very specific in science, which means if you think that it's too detailed, it's not. Keep making more details. Be very specific. Don't be general. And that means if we look at the rules for writing our method and our materials, we need a couple of things. First of all, yet again, we do not use I, we, us, them. There is no pronouns that we are going to use. You're not going to speak in the first person. You need to bullet point it. As we can see alongside on the example, you can see theirs is bullet pointed already. You must use exact measurements. And so, in other words, you can't just say, I use some water. I need to know exactly how much, 100 mils of water. 250 mils of water. And you need to be very detailed. What kind of water? Is it salt water? Is it fresh water? Is the water at a particular temperature? Is it cold? Is it hot? And even cold and hot is not detailed enough. Giving specifics is the most important part when writing down the method. Now, alongside here, we can isolate some of the key things within the method. They've told us, for example, here that we need four test tubes, each with a different concentration of sucrose. They've told us that in test tube A, there was 100 mils of water, C being very specific, with no sucrose added. Test tube B with 0 0.5 grams of sucrose, still the same amount of 100 mils of water. And test tube C has 1 gram in also 100, and then D, 1.5 in 100. So you see what they've done here is 
They've told you every test tube has 100 mils of water and the concentration is different in each and this is how much it is in each. They go on then to say that we use the same species of yeast. We used a small amount of salt that was added, in my opinion, to improve this method. They should actually tell you how much salt. It then says each apparatus was left to stand for 10 minutes. Good, it's telling us for how long we're gonna do this experiment. And lastly, it tells us what we are going to be measuring, which in this case is the volume of gas produced by the yeast. Because remember, um, if you are respiring, and for those of you who don't know this just yet, when you respire, you create gas. So humans create carbon dioxide when we respire so we're going to measure some kind of gas and that is how we create the method and materials and you can use these rules to create your own now we get into a little bit more of an advanced aspect of this experiment and that is something called a control experiment Often you will be asked to set up an investigation and within your investigation and your whole experiment, you need something called a control experiment. Now, what is a control? Well, a control experiment is a part of your investigation or your experiment where your independent variable has been removed and all the other variables are going to remain the same. And so often, this is a very tricky one for students. We struggle to think about what is our control. The easiest thing for me to uh, give you in terms of advice would be this. If you have an experiment and you have to take away the main player of that experiment, the thing or the substance that is doing the work, you often find that that is a control experiment. And we'll use this example alongside because it does have the control already in it. And I'm going to point it out to you. Now, if you are creating your own control and you don't uh, are not given one like we are here, and I'm going to show you where it is in the example alongside, you are going to create a control in the following ways. Number one, as I said, you're going to remove the independent variable. Step two, often, that means that whatever you're going to be using is missing the substance, the being or the test subject is missing. Now, let's apply this to the control experiment alongside. Now, if you look very carefully, you can actually find the very, very first um, test tube is our control experiment. And I know this for one very simple reason. It contains no sucrose. So we just underline that and make a clear point of that. And if we go back to the original statement at the beginning, we knew that the concentration of sucrose was what? The independent variable. So if we take the independent variable out, which is sucrose, we are just left with a water experiment, which is perfect because we want to see, will the yeast still do something even if there's no sugar there? So that test tube A is our control experiment. It is missing the independent variable. And that is how we would identify it. Now we get into validity and reliability. Sometimes one of the trickiest components of an experiment because we're not really sure which one is which, we can't tell the difference. And often it's the most requested thing that my own students want to know. Now let's break down what is validity first. So validity is speaking about how accurate your results are. And when we speak about accuracy, we're talking about did you keep everything the same all the way through your experiment. In other words, are all the variables constant? So if we look at our example on the right-hand side, we know that we used 100 mils in all of our test tubes of water. We used the same species of yeast and we allowed all of our test tubes to stand for 10 minutes for the same amount of time. So all of these things that we kept constant and we kept the same, are the validity aspects. There are our fixed variables, which is often a word that you may encounter in class as well, a fixed variable. And so we had the same amount of water, the same species, the same amount of time. And so keep that word the same in your mind when you're trying to think of uh, validity. Another way to remember what validity is, is that validity are variables like the letter V. So variables and validity. The next important aspect of our experiment is whether or not it is reliable. And so that's where reliability comes in. Now, reliability means how consistent are your results? 
This means if someone were to redo that experiment or your experiment, would they get the same results? Are your results reliable? And to prove that your results are reliable, there's a couple of things you can do. The first thing you must do to create reliability is to repeat the experiment as much as possible. And that means doing the whole experiment over and over again, not just one aspect of it. Another thing you can do is you can increase the sample size. So instead of using 10 people, you'll use 100 people. And lastly, you can calculate an average, meaning that you can take all the results because you've done your experiment over and over again. You've got many answers. You take them together and you calculate an average. And averages often give you the best result because it's closest to what you expect will happen. Now, in this example on the right hand side, they haven't done any reliability just yet before you think they have. They haven't repeated the experiment just yet. OK, yes, they've used different test tubes, but that's not repeating the experiment and they haven't increased the sample size. The best way to do it for this example, if I was writing down an answer like how to increase the reliability of this experiment, I would have said things like redo the experiment, increase the amount of test tubes being used or calculate an average of all of the answers or results received from each of the test tubes. It's important, and this is a very key step here, everybody, you cannot change any variables if you want to keep reliability. In other words, you can't change the amount of water. You can't say, use more test tubes with more sugar solutions. No, that's changing the experiment. You have to take what you have and repeat it. You mustn't add more yeast. You mustn't take away water. You mustn't add more sugar. The moment you add and subtract things, you are changing the experiment. So you've conducted your experiment and now you have a set of results. And this results table has all of our results in it. It has our time running along down the side here which shows us how long the progression of this experiment went on for, for the full 10 minutes. It tells us the volume of gas produced by our yeast cells going along the top here, and that is measured in milliliters. And then each column represents a different amount of sucrose. Now, you may be asked to fill in the table or you'll be given a table like this that's already filled out. Now, what do you do with this? Generally, the follow-up question is draw a graph to represent this information. Now, in a different video, I'm going to explain to you which graph to choose. Is this a histogram? Is this a pie chart? Is this a bar graph? Is this a line graph? Which is the right graph to choose? Because often the uh, type of data that you've collected will tell you what graph to plot. Now, just to put your mind at ease, if you're thinking about, well, which graph it is it, this particular one is going to be a line graph because it is continuous data. I'll explain the difference between discontinuous and continuous data in another video, which is why it's important to put on your notifications so that you can see these videos as soon as possible and stay on track during your school year. So we're at the very end of our experiment. We have our results, we've conducted our experiment, and now we need to write a conclusion. We need to conclude what we have been doing. And what I've done here is I've included both the opening statement, which has our aim in it, and our results. And you take these two pieces of information and you are going to use them to construct the conclusion. So a conclusion, what is it? is simply a final statement confirming or disproving our hypothesis. So if you remember way in the beginning, I said our hypothesis is something like, as the concentration of sucrose increases, cellular respiration increases. So that was my hypothesis. Now the conclusion must say, this is true or not. And so when you are writing your hypothesis, um, I beg your pardon, your conclusion, you need to think of the following things. You need to think of it must have the independent and dependent variables in it. It must either support or disprove my hypothesis. And it may not contain any results. I don't want to see any numbers. You're either going to say, yes, as the increase in sucrose goes up, so does the respiration rate. Or no, as sucrose increases, the respiration rate decreases. So we're not going to use numbers. You should never be talking about results in a conclusion. That is safe for something very different, which we haven't done in this video, and we're not going to in the scientific method in the basics. Lastly, it's important to remember that the conclusion is a statement. 
just like the aim, it is not a question, it is a statement. So there's no um, when, where, how. Instead, what you are doing is you're literally taking your hypothesis and rewording it by simply saying, to conclude, as sucrose increases, so does respiration rate increase in yeast. And the only way to actually truly prove that is to look at the information in our graph and to see that yes indeed as our um, sucrose increased so it went from five grams or actually from zero grams to 1.5 grams we noticed that the volume of gas increased because the highest value is at the bottom corner here 9.4 whereas the lowest value was 2.0 where they all actually began so that basically means as sucrose increases respiration increases. And that would be my conclusion, confirming my hypothesis. Now I've concluded this lesson today with an example question. So if you'd like to practice what you've learned, I've included an example here for you to pause the video right now and you can go through it. Otherwise, I'm going to then fast forward the video onto the memo so that you can see what the answers are that go along with this. And here are the answers to that exam question. Now, if you've liked this video, don't forget to give a thumbs up, a subscribe, and please turn on your notifications. I want you to get the videos as soon as possible so that you can go over your work and you can be ready for any of your activities and assessments at school. As always, I'll see you all again soon. Bye.